Hi. Okay, let's talk about the placental mammals now. We talked about the monotremes and the marsupials a little bit in the last video. So the placental mammals are the eutherians, and this root, we can see that Greek root that means true or good, and therian is, is beast. So the eutherians are the true beasts, uh, apparently, according to... Um, the naming, Linnaeus's naming system. So uh, eutherians have a much more efficient placenta. So they can keep the embryos internally much longer than the marsupials can. So if you remember, the marsupials do have a meager placenta, but their um, uh, babies need to be born at an extremely immature uh, embryonic stage. Um, although all eutherian mammals don't have the same type of efficient placenta, some are better than others. Like, for example, bears don't have the greatest placenta. Uh, and so bear babies also have to be born quite young and immature. And you might have seen video of the tiny, tiny little newborn pandas uh, that require many months of um, uh, extreme care by the mother and are so tiny compared to the mother bear. And that's because their placenta is less efficient than some other animals. And so they have to have a shorter gestation and be born more prematurely. So here's our phylogeny of the mammals and our uh, first most ancient mammal here first appeared in the fossil record in about the middle of the age of the dinosaurs. So the beginning of the age of the dinosaurs, we have the first synapsids, who were not quite mammals yet, but were on their way to becoming mammals. Uh, the oldest mammals are the monotremes, and they, so probably the first mammal, the first uh, animal that fed their babies milk, was an egg-laying species like the monotremes are today. Um, the marsupials are do have a placenta and don't lay eggs, but because their placenta is not so hot, they have to have their babies born very, very early during development. And then they kind of have a second pregnancy inside the pouch. And then uh, we'll talk about these four major groups of eutherians. Some of these groups, again, have been um, uh, put together partially based on DNA evidence because there are some very weird mammals that for a long time it was not known who they are more closely related to. So here's our monotremes again, and very few species of monotremes and marsupials compared to placental mammals. So monotremes lay eggs, produce milk, but have no um, nipples, so instead the, um, the mammary glands are, again, modified sweat glands during uh, development. Uh, so they just kind of exude milk on their belly, and the babies drink it that way. Um, marsupials kind of have two pregnancies, the second one inside the pouch, and marsupials include a lot of very familiar Australian animals like kangaroos, koalas, wallabies. Uh, the only one we have in North America is the opossum. Um, now here we have some orders that are s s closely related to each other, uh, and this in fact was confirmed with DNA. Elephants, manatees, and hyraxes. Hyraxes, for a long time, this order, uh, it was not really known where it belonged in the family tree of mammals because they sort of look like rodents. They live in the high desert in the Middle East. They sort of look like rodents, but they don't have rodent skull characteristics. And it turns out they're actually much more closely related to elephants than they are anything else. And aardvarks are kind of the oddballs here. Um, aardvarks are African mammals that eat ants and termites, 
and they have a lot of really odd things about them, including very weird teeth um, that are unlike any other mammal. And it turns out that uh, although they're kind of the outgroup amongst these four orders, they are this is who they're more closely related to. Um, but they are the most distantly related of the four cousin orders here. So in the in your textbook, these are from your textbook. The ones that are colored the same color, the orders that are in the same background color, like all these green ones here, that means that they're more closely related to each other. Uh, and then we have this oddball group here, the Xenartha, and this is one again that was put together using DNA evidence because there's a bunch of oddballs in this group and we see the prefix here, Xena, that means uh, weird, <laughs> so, or strange, or foreign, uh, and we have the sloths, anteaters, and armadillos all in the same group. Um, and anteaters and aardvarks are one of those examples of convergent evolution that they kind of superficially resemble each other because they have a similar diet, but they're actually very distantly related. And armadillos are very weird as well. Well, you probably all know that sloths are weird, uh, including growing algae in their fur to help them to camouflage. But armadillos are the only mammals that give birth to identical quadruplets every pregnancy. So the armadillo zygote starts to divide into an embryo and then it splits into four and so they almost always have four babies and they're all genetically identical. They're like identical quadruplets so that's really weird as well. Um, rabbits and hares the, belong in the lagomorphs, and this is another ongoing controversy in zoology that has gone on for oh many, probably over a hundred years, is are rabbits rodents, are hares rodents, do rabbits and hares belong together, or do they all belong in the rodents? This has been an ongoing controversy which just during my scientific career, at one point, rabbits were rodents and hares were lagomorphs. At another point, hares were rodents and rabbits were lagomorphs. And now DNA has confirmed that even though there are a lot of similarities between the lagomorphs and the rodents, they belong in separate orders, that they are more distantly related. And pikas are another one that, you know, are they rodents? Are they not rodents? Where They are very rodent-like characteristics. They're little um, rat-like mammals that live in uh, at high altitudes in mountainous regions in North America. So those belong in the lagomorphs. Rodents are one of the more abundant orders. There are thousands of species of rodents, and these include things that you know are rodents like mice and rats, but also squirrels and beavers, and even porcupines are rodents. Uh, and rodents share one very odd trait, is that their front teeth grow continuously, and they have to constantly chew and bite on things to keep their teeth from growing um, continuously. Uh, and then is our group primates. So our group, the primates, is the closest cousin orders to us would be the lagomorphs and the rodents, which was kind of a surprise. Um, uh, you know, we did not think that that would be the case, but DNA shows that in fact it is. And we'll talk in more detail about the primates, including um, monkeys, apes, and us, but also the more primitive primates, the lemurs, um, and when primates first appeared, and a little bit about human evolution. One thing to note here that is something that I commonly see um, incorrectly noted all over the place, uh, all primates are omnivorous, and so an omnivore is an organism that eats both plants and animals. And even primates that have a huge portion of their diet as plants eat some animals, even if those animals are just insects as the only animal portion of their diet. But there are no herbivorous primates. There are no primates whatsoever who eat only plants. Even the leaf-eating monkeys 
who are named because it was thought that they only ate plants. <laughs> in fact, they also need insects as part of their diet or they die because they lack vitamin B12. All right, birds, that's enough. But we'll talk more about the primates. Um, and then several other orders that are really important, the carnivore order, and not everything in the carnivore order is a carnivore like um, panda bears, which evolved from a carnivorous ancestor. But almost everything in the carnivore order is carnivorous or omnivorous, like the rest of the bears are omnivorous, and they can switch back and forth between eating large game animals and eating berries, you know, and those are available. Um, and they also eat insects and, you know, beetle grubs and other things. Uh, but carnivores include dogs and cats as well. Um, then we have the even-toed ungulates, the, and uh, it has been discovered pretty recently in the last 30 years that, in fact, cetaceans, the whales, dolphins, and porpoises, it used to be thought, oh, Linnaeus thought this, that they were more closely related to walruses and seals, but it turns out, no, cetaceans are actually more closely related to hippos, deer, and cows than they are to uh, the other aquatic mammals, the seals and walruses. So uh, cetaceans includes whales, dolphins, and porpoises, and it was very hard to place them who their land ancestor was. So all of the aquatic mammals, mammals evolved on land. So any mammal that is not a land animal, especially the cetaceans who are fully adapted to a uh, marine environment, um, these, uh, they evolved from a four-legged land ancestor. And the question for a long time was, which group is it? Which group is their land ancestor? And it took some really extraordinary fossil finds and combined with DNA evidence to solve that mystery. And in fact, their closest relative on land is the hippo, which isn't a big surprise. Um, the odd-toed ungulates includes uh, horses, zebras, rhinos. Um, zebras and horses are fairly closely related, which you can probably guess just by looking at them. Uh, bats are another order that has a huge number of species. Bats are the third group of vertebrates to adapt to the land, or to adapt to flying, rather. We have pterodactyls, who are extinct, birds, and bats are the three orders of vertebrates that independently uh, through natural selection acquired the ability to fly, not just glide, but fly. There are quite a few other mammal groups that have gliders like uh, flying squirrels, which are in the rodents. Um, and bats fall into two big categories. They're uh, the insect-eating bats and the fruit-eating bats. The fr if you're not sure which kind of a bat it is, well, we have no fruit-eating bats around here. But uh, if it's a really cute bat and it looks kind of like a little dog, then it's a fruit-eating bat. If it's uh, got weird shaped ears and nose and um, looks like something out of a horror movie, then it's an insect eating bat because they use sonar to echolocate for their food. So that gives them a weird shaped face. Um, and then there are these weird insectivorous mammals, which you probably have never really seen one, including moles and shrews. Uh, which are live spend almost all of their time underground, which is why you probably wouldn't have seen one, even though they live around here. Shrews especially, there are shrews are are not that rare in uh, the Midwest. Um, so let's talk about primates, since that's our order. We like to talk about us the most. Uh, that's enough birds. Um, we like to talk about ourselves the most. So primates have some shared derived characteristics that are specific to the primates. Uh, primates all have grasping hands and feet. Um, most have a, a fully opposable thumb, meaning that they can do this kind of a grasping motion, but all have at least digits that can do this to grasp tree branches. All right, that's enough. Stop it. Uh, 
very large brains for animals. All the primates have large brain to body size ratio and are very social. And it's thought now that that's the connection with brain size. It doesn't matter what the animal does as part of its lifestyle, catching prey or whatever, but the most social animals have the biggest brains. So the bigger the brain, the more complex social life they can manage. And think about how many people you can keep track of. I mean, an individual human keep, can keep track of a few hundred people and know the details of their lives and who they're married to and who their kids are and who they're friends with and how do I know them. And, you know, you, you can have a few hundred people that are acquaintances and friends. Um, there aren't any other primates that can keep track of that many individuals. The very smartest uh, apes and monkeys can keep track of about 25 to 30 individuals and know what's my relationship to that individual. Can I count on them to share food with me? Should I be afraid of them? Or might they bite me or hurt me in some way? So that's the kind of information that you need a large brain to store. Um, Primates also all have forward-facing eyes and binocular vision, which gives us depth perception. And that evolved because of being uh, arboreal, living in trees. So if you're jumping around in trees from branch to branch, having good depth perception would be a significant advantage. And that's why our primate ancestors evolved to have eyes facing front, even though they're prey animals. So prey animals typically have their eyes on the sides of their head, so they get the widest possible vision to watch out for predators. But primates evolved to have their eyes facing front because being able to see the next branch in front of you and have good depth perception was a better skill than being able to see all the predators in a 360 degree view around them. Um, primates as well, except for us, have an opposable thumb on their feet as well for gripping branches. Um, so the very earliest primates that first appeared in the fossil record about 55 million years ago, so a few million years after the dinosaurs went extinct. The first primates were very much like lemurs today and tarsiers, which are very closely related to lemurs. Um, lemurs have the primate characteristics. They don't have a fully opposable thumb, but they have grasping fingers and toes and are, live in trees. And many of the first primates, we can tell, were also nocturnal. So nocturnal means that they're active at night. So how would we know that? Well, if you see a, a fossilized animal and you, it has enormous eye sockets, that tells you that that animal was probably active at night because uh, one of the adaptations for excellent night vision is to have huge eyes. More light gets in, better vision at night. Uh, we no longer have that adaptation. Our ancestors um, ceased to be nocturnal many tens of millions of years ago. So we no longer have that. But the first primates uh, lived in trees and were nocturnal, judging by the size of the eyes in their fossils. And they had eyes that faced front. They had binocular vision, and that means good depth perception for living in the trees. Um, monkeys are uh, very abundant. There are many species of monkeys. I wish we had monkeys that were native to the Midwest. There are monkeys that could live on the climate that, uh, that we have here. Um, monkeys are separated into two main branches, New World and Old World. The New World monkeys are a very ancient branch in the primate tree, and they are very recognizable as being a different branch from the Old World monkey. So New World means North and South America. Old world is everything else. So New World monkeys have a very flat face and uh, look more human-like, if you want to think of it that way. And Old World monkeys have a more dog-shaped face with an extended snout. Uh, so this is a baboon, and these are... Um, um, oh, the word just went right out of my head. Capuchin monkeys or capuchin monkeys from Central America. 
Uh, these are considered among, if not the smartest species of monkey. And they also live in the largest social group. They live in a social group of around 25 to 50 individuals. Uh, our group, the apes, uh, first appeared about 15 million years after the first monkeys appeared. And apes ha are larger, have larger brains, and have no tail. So if you see uh, a primate and you're not sure is it a monkey or an ape, because some of the, there are some large monkeys and there are some smallish apes, the gibbons, and you're not sure which group it belongs to. If it doesn't have any tail at all, then it's an ape. And of course, you know, we don't have a tail. We're apes. And Linnaeus was the first person to recognize that and put us in this group. Um, Linnaeus's most controversial move as a scientist was to say um, that humans are animals, that we're primates, give us a species name, and say that we're most closely related to apes. Um, he made a lot of people very upset doing that. Uh, we now know, thanks to DNA, that in fact, just like Darwin thought, chimpanzees are our closest living relatives. These are not chimpanzees. These are gorillas. Uh, chimpanzees are our closest living relative, and in fact, our DNA is 98% identical to chimpanzees. So here's our primate tree. So 65 million years ago, here's the extinction of the dinosaurs, right, right here, 65 million years ago. The first primate appeared about 55 million years ago. And the most, and they were most like lemurs um, that are still around today. Uh, and then we have, you know, tarsiers are closely related to them. And then we have the New World monkeys were another branch off here about 35 million years ago. Uh, the first apes branched off about 15 million years ago. Um, and then our species, our exact species, Homo sapiens, we've only been around for about 250,000 years. And our last common ancestor with the rest of the apes was, or with chimpanzees specifically, was around 8 million years ago. So not, not really that long ago. Um, the rest of the apes, the apes are a smallish group, not that many species. There's a, two species of gorillas. Um, I think there's two species of orangutans now, a couple of species of gibbons, two species of chimpanzees, the, chim the common chimpanzee and the bonobo chimpanzee, which we are equally distantly related to. Um, there are people who, for various reasons, thought we must be more closely related to the common chimpanzee or we must be more closely related to the bonobo chimpanzee. But in fact, DNA shows that we are equally distantly related to both of them, that they're both the this, this same. So that means we had a common ancestor with uh, chimpanzees and bonobo chimpanzees, and the split was about at the same time. So chimpanzees and bonobos and us split off at the same time. Um, we are really weird for primates, and if we are going to have hypotheses for how humans evolved by natural selection, then we need to explain all of these weird traits that we have. So some of our weird traits are that we have the largest animal brain relative to body size. Um, dolphins are close, but we actually have a larger brain relative to our body size. Um, we're the only bipedal placental mammal that's dedicated bipedal. There are many, many other mammals that can stand on their hind legs, walk a little bit on their hind legs. Um, and there are marsupials that are bipedal, like uh, kangaroos and a few other um, marsupials. But in the primates, we're the only dedicated bipedal mammal. Um, we're mostly hairless, which is weird for a mammal. And other uh, hairless Mammals have a very obvious reason for being hairless, like all the cetaceans are hairless because hair creates drag in a watery environment. Um, we have a different reason for being hairless. Uh, we're the only primate that sweats a lot to cool. Uh, chimpanzees and gorillas uh, barely can sweat at all. Uh, other primates do have sweat glands, 
but we, oh, we sweat buckets compared to the other primates. Um, the only other mammal that I can think of that sweats as much as, as humans do are horses. And our common ancestor with horses didn't sweat a lot. So that's not the explanation. Um, we have a unique foot shape among all mammals for walking. Um, we also use fire to cook most of our food, and we have been doing so for about 3 million years. So before our species even existed, our ancestors were cooking food regularly, if not daily. And that made a big difference to our digestive system. Cooked food has greater nutrient availability and also is easier to chew. And that's probably one of the reasons we have reduced teeth. So our teeth compared to chimpanzee teeth are much smaller. Um, we also have a very short intestine compared to other primates. In fact, it's about half the length that you would expect it to be if we were any other kind of a primate. So our short intestine is, and our reduced teeth are both related to our change in diet. The reduced teeth probably has more to do with the fact that we cook our food, and our short intestine has to do with the fact that our we no longer have fermentation in our gut. Most other primates have at least a moderate amount of fermentation of cellulose in their gut. Uh, we have almost zero. Um, so that, that means that we were eating fewer plants and more animals. And that meant that we could take energy that was being devoted to digestion and turn it to our brains because an intestine is also a very energetically expensive tissue like the brain. Um, we have language, obviously, that's kind of our most obvious trait, uh, and tool making technology. So chimpanzees make tools, a few other animals make tools. Um, and making a tool is different than using a tool. A much larger group of animals use tools, but don't make tools. Uh, but we obviously have the best technology that I'm using to talk to you right now. Um, we also have very complex culture that varies regionally, including things like music, which no other animals have. Um, and we also weirdly have female menopause um, and we just take this so much for granted that we don't think th about the fact that this had to evolve by natural selection. No other primates have this post-reproductive old age. Uh, for chimpanzees, many of which have been observed in the zoo now until the natural end of their life, female chimpanzees can give birth in their 40s and then the next year die of old age. Uh, th and it seems like we have taken that ape lifespan, which is about 40 to 50 years, and we've just tacked on another 40 to 50 years of non-reproductive adulthood. So that evolved by natural selection. So how do we explain that? We need an explanation for that, and anthropologists have one. So one of the, the big puzzles in uh, anthropology for a long time was which evolved first? We have a very large brain and we're bipedal. Which one came first? Because uh, starting with Darwin, who Darwin was the first one oh, about 150 years ago to really start speculating about human evolution and how humans could have evolved by natural selection. There were no fossils of ancestral humans at that time. That He had living chimpanzees and gorillas to study and no fossils. Fossils have slowly been discovered over the last 150 years that have answered this question. But 50 years ago, anthropologists had a lot of extinct humans uh, to study, but they couldn't answer the question with fossils yet. And the, the hypothesis was that, well, probably brain size increased first. And then we had to be bipedal because now we had all these tools and things to carry. Uh, or that perhaps they happen simultaneously. Perhaps we slowly became more bipedal and slowly increased our brain size and they happen simultaneously. And well, fossil discoveries continued and as you know, often happens in science, the hypotheses were wrong. And in fact, they needed to come up with a completely new hypothesis because it turns out that walking upright came first. That 
there they found fossil evidence of humans who had a brain that was barely bigger than a chimpanzee brain who were fully bipedal and walked just like modern humans. Um, so why? Why would upright why would bipedal walking evolve in an ape that had a brain that was barely larger than a chimpanzee? So they weren't, you know, making large numbers of tools and you know doing things that modern humans do. And the current hypothesis is that it was for very energy efficient walking, and this has been shown experimentally. I'll tell you about that experiment in a second. So we're just going to focus on the two most recent genuses of humans, um, Australopithecus and our own genus of Homo. Um, so an experiment was done a few years ago to try to prove whether or not walking bipedally is more energy efficient. So they took humans and they trained chimpanzees to walk on a treadmill. Um, wearing one of these devices that measures carbon dioxide output, which is how you measure how many calories you're burning very, very precisely. And so they trained these chimpanzees to do this, and the chimpanzees did it willingly because they were getting treats probably for doing it. So they had chimpanzees, because chimpanzees walk two different ways. They can walk quadrupedally, which means with four feet, they kind of knuckle walk on their hands, or they can walk for short distances on just two legs like we do. So they train chimpanzees to walk both ways and it turns out that chimpanzees use about the same number of calories no matter how they're walking. Whether they're walking on two legs or whether they're walking on all four, they use about the same amount of calories. And it turns out it's four times the number of calories that humans use who weigh the same amount. So they had college students that were weight matched with these chimpanzees and these college students were not athletes these were just regular old college students and they were using one quarter the calories to cover the same distance so what does that tell us that tells us that our style of walking upright on two legs is very energy efficient so our ancestors adapted to walking long distances why can't chimpanzees do this? They don't need to walk long distances. They live in dense forests and all their food is right there. They eat uh, plant products, including mostly fruit, but they also eat a lot of leaves. And then they catch small animals, especially they like to eat monkeys, but they also eat lizards. They catch and eat those uh, occasionally as well. Um, but our ancestors apparently set out into the grassland, into the drier areas, and needed to be able to walk long distances without burning up too many calories. And that was what our ancestors were adapted to. So the oldest evidence that we have for fully bipedal walking are some footprints, the famous Laetoli footprints who that you may have heard of. These were discovered in the 1960s. They were found in an ash fall, an ancient ash fall from a volcanic eruption. And if you uh, know anything about fossils, the best fossils are preserved in volcanic ash, especially fine ash. So there was a volcanic eruption in uh, East Sub-Saharan Africa 3.7 million years ago, and two humans walked through the ash, the, the wet freshly fallen ash of this volcanic eruption and left their footprints preserved for us to see. So uh, if you can see, it's, there's a lot of shadow in this particular image, but I couldn't find a better one online. So you can see there's one adult and one child walking here. They're walking with their toes pointed forwards, just like we walk today. The big toe is already in line with the toes, with the rest of the toes, not like a chimpanzee that has a big toe that's an opposable, like another opposable thumb. So there was already a lot of evolution towards bipedality that had occurred by this point. And based on other bones that were discovered in the same region that are about the same age, the species that scientists think made these footprints is an Australopithecine. So Australopithecus afarensis um, is probably the species that made 
these footprints. And it was probably a parent and a child walking together through this ash fall. So we know that our ancestors at this time were very bipedal, just like we are today. Um, so here is a graph that shows the change in, and this is based on the fossil record, the change in walking style and the change in brain size. And then the species are across the bottom here. So here's us over here, uh, Neanderthals about 100,000 years ago. Or we're fully bipedal and have a brain the same size as our brain. That's why this is kind of leveled out here, although they're not our direct ancestors. Uh, so here we have um, about 5 million years ago, our common ancestor with chimpanzees has separated. And the species that's going to eventually start the transition to Australopithecines and our genus of Homo has begun. 5 million years ago. So we have a brain that's barely, barely increasing in size, and we have an ape that's transitioning over, this is, there's several species that are involved here, uh, to being fully bipedal. So now if we go to the, be the end of the Australopithecine, so that's during the Australopithecine. So this line here, this is when Australopithecus afarensis was around. This is when those Laetoli footprints were being made was around three million years ago right here. So then we have the first members of our genus of Homo who have are fully bipedal. And you notice this line doesn't change at all now. They are fully bipedal skeletally, but to still have a pretty small brain. Um, now brain size starts to increase. So that's the next question is, okay, they're traveling out onto the grassland. They need to walk long distances. Where they are found is, is too dry to be fully forested. They're out in the grassland. What are they eating? There isn't a lot of food for a primate out in the grassland. So it is believed that this is when our species really started scavenging animals and increasing the amount of uh, meat in the diet. And hunting begins. Um, the, f the oldest members of our genus, Homo habilis, uh, there's fossil evidence that they made weapons and that they butchered animals. So they were now not just scavenging carcasses, but hunting and butchering carcasses. And one of the ways that we can tell that there are human hunters this long ago is that in the fossil record, large game species start to decline. So uh, large animals are, have, there's a new predator in Africa three million years ago, and it was us or our ancestors. Um, and we can see that this happens every place as, as our species started to travel around the planet. The same thing happened everywhere. Every place humans show up, the large hunting size animals disappear and sometimes go extinct. So if we're looking at uh, a chimpanzee compared to one of those australopithecines, uh, it, what skeletal features had evolved already? The brain is just a little bit bigger. It's not even twice as, twice as big yet. Um, it's like 50% bigger. But where the skull attaches to the body has shifted. Instead of having the hole pointing, the hole that connects to the spine pointing more towards the back, like pretty much every other mammal in Australopithecines, the hole has moved to being under the skull. Because, of course, we don't want our head like this. We need to point forward. Um, the vertebrae fit together differently. Instead of having a kind of a flat or a C-shaped spine. Australopithecines now have that lumbar curve that we see in all human ancestors. Um, what is the purpose of that lumbar curve? Why did it evolve? Um, probably as a shock absorber for bipedal walking. Bipedal walking is much more jarring. So that S-shaped spine helps to absorb the shock of that. Uh, Australopithecines still had pretty short legs. Um, for chimpanzees, their arms are actually longer than their legs, and we have reversed that. Our legs are much longer than our arms. 
all the better to walk. And we can see that trend already starting with Australopithecines. They have shorter fingers and they have shorter arms because they're not climbing trees. They don't need those huge, long, powerful arms and really long fingers for climbing trees like chimpanzees do. Um, the shape of the pelvis changes and the angle at which the femurs fit into the pelvis also shifts. Uh, for Australopithecines and for our genus, when we walk, our kneecaps point forward and our toes point forward. For chimpanzees and gorillas, if they are walking on their hind legs, they're, they're pigeon-toed. They're or not pigeon-toed. Um, pigeon-toed is like this. Uh, they're feet point out and their kneecaps point outwards. So already by the time the Australopithecines evolved that had shifted. Why? Why is it better to have your feet pointing forward and your kneecaps pointing forward? Because it's more energy efficient. Walking with your feet splayed outwards is takes more energy. It's less efficient. So here's the changes that happened in our feet. So first, here's a chimpanzee hand and a human hand. And you can see that they have a much smaller thumb and very long fingers. And even the palm is long. And that's for climbing. They are very powerful climbers. They have an extremely strong upper body, much stronger than your average human. Um, but, and look at the difference in the feet. So this is a chimpanzee foot. And just like every other primate, chimpanzees, their big toe is opposable, and they can use it for grasping branches. And also, you can see why having a foot that's this shape would make it difficult to walk bipedally. So the way our feet are is unique in primates. Our big toe is no longer opposable. Instead, it's in line with the other toes all for better walking. So we are truly adapted for walking long distances energy efficiently. And sweating and hairlessness go right along with this too. We are supremely adapted for endurance in the heat. We are about the only species that can exercise in, in the heat for hours if we have enough water. Um, without getting heat stroke or becoming overheated. Um, almost all the other animals, even tropical animals, even animals that live uh, you know, in equatorial Africa, cannot exercise during day, during the heat of the day, like we can. And that's hypothesized now for how our early ancestors were hunting, because the weapons they had were the Australopithecines. Would they, if they were hunting, and the early members of our genus Homo, um, like Homo habilis, if they were starting to be effective hunters, they only had sharpened sticks and rocks. Those were the only tool, hunting tools that they had. So, how do you catch a gazelle if all you have, or a zebra, if you have a sharpened stick and a rock? Uh, and you have no projectile weapons at all. Well, they had to chase them. And you don't have to catch them. You don't have to be faster than them. They would. The persistence hunting means that you just keep them running. You keep them running. You keep them running until they keel over from heat exhaustion. And uh, this little video that I have a link to, I'm not going to show it to you because it's right now because it's about six minutes long, but um, you can go to the PowerPoint and link to this particular video. It's a little demonstration that was done for um, the BBC uh, by some, um, sub, uh, some South African hunting, hunters who demonstrated this persistence hunting technique. And the hypothesis came about because an anthropologist actually went and was talking to these, uh, um, I don't want to call them hunter-gatherers because they're not really anymore. They use modern weapons and wear shoes, you know, as you'll see now. But they uh, were very recently hunter-gatherers. So within the last hundred years, they were still hunter-gatherers. And an anthropologist asked them, if you don't have a rifle, how do you, how do you catch these animals? And so they showed them. They're like, well, you just you make them collapse. They cannot tolerate the heat the way that our species can. So really, that's what we're adapted for. Um, 
One misconception about human evolution is that we evolved from chimpanzees. And that's a common argument that you hear. People will say, well, if humans evolved from chimpanzees, well, then why are there still chimpanzees? Well, the answer is that we did not evolve from chimpanzees. Chimpanzees have been evolving along their own trajectory. We've been evolving along our trajectory. We just share a common ancestor with chimpanzees. We did not evolve from chimpanzees. Um, it used to be thought as well, and Darwin thought this, that we were going to find human ancestors in like a ladder-like progression slowly leading to us. And in fact, it's turned out that human evolution is a huge branching bush with far more species of extinct human ancestors and non-ancestors, dead ends, than anybody ever imagined. And so let, let's look at that real quick here. So this is the most recent kind of consensus tree of all of the Australopithecines and members of the genus Homo that I could find. So the hominins, hominin is a term that's used for all of, for our species, and all of our extinct ancestors. So starting from when we split from chimpanzees about 8 million years ago, and that's what this split down here represents. And here's uh, Pan troglodytes, that's the common chimpanzee, and Pan paniscus is the bonobo chimpanzee. So we have this split about 8 million years ago. So everything over here those are the hominins, and there's a lot of species, and they're all extinct except us. And one thing that's interesting that they did on this graph is they put a little blue bar to show when our species existed. So our species has been around for about 250,000 years, and you can see that there's a lot of overlap. So these lines end when that species went extinct. That's when it went extinct. Uh, and the the colored bar, that indicates the fossil evidence, that we have fossil evidence for that species existing at that time. And you'll notice that some species existed for a long time, like Homo erectus, and this is all colored in here, so that indicates we have a lot of fossil evidence that Homo erectus existed for over a million and a half years, in fact, into the current um, and into when our species existed. But if you look across this way here, look at how many species existed on the planet when our species was around. Uh, Neanderthals here, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo denisova, these all three are species and these existed together in Asia and Europe. Uh, this is Homo radiciensis here is uh, most anthropologists would put this in a different species, um, Homo heidelbergensis um, and Homo naledi. This is an African species that coexisted with our species. This is one, the Red Deer Cave people, they don't even have a proper species name yet. They existed very recently, they uh, around 11,000 years ago in China, but their skeletal evidence, clearly they were not our species. <laughs> they might be Denisovans. We don't know because we don't have a DNA comparison. Uh, Homo luzon, uh, luzoniensis, this is one that's in, um, in uh, I think it's in, Luzon Island is, um, I think, Indonesia or Micronesia. I can't remember. Uh, this is from an island. So another archaic species that was alive when our species was. And Homo floresiensis, this is a very small brain species found on the island of Flores in Indonesia. Uh, that it went extinct about um, 50,000 years ago. So a very branching bush here with extinctions at different times, lots of overlap between these different species existing at the same time. Um, and clearly some of these, uh, you know, we have a lot of unknowns here, um, how these all fit together. But uh, very interesting, and new fossils are discovered every few years. There's another new one discovered, like Homo naledi is a fairly recent discovery. Homo luzonensis is another fairly recent discovery. But um, yeah, it was, uh, it's not a, not a simple uh, phylogeny to uh, pick apart. And for almost all of these, we have no DNA. 
Uh, Neanderthals and Denisovans, we have DNA. But for pretty much all the rest, no preserved DNA. They're just too old. Um, the limit for DNA is about 1 million years. So anything that went extinct before 1 million years ago, we got like no chance of getting DNA from them. So here's the species that uh, scientists think made those Laetoli footprints. Australopithecus afarensis. And now I, I have uh, uh, images that are artist renderings, but really for the evolution of hairlessness, we really don't know when that happened. We don't know when our uh, ape ancestor started to lose their hair and when we became completely hairless. Maybe, you know, when our, our genus Homo first appeared, but we really don't know because it doesn't fossilize. What we have are bones. We have bones of butchered animals. We have campfire evidence um, and other artifacts, but we really, I mean, until you get very recent, no hair, no skin. So really don't know when the hairlessness evolved. Um, okay, Australopithecus was pretty short, um, up to maybe four feet tall, so much shorter than modern humans. Very well known about 300 different individuals uh, we have bones from, although a lot of them are just small pieces, like a piece of a jaw with a few teeth in it. Uh, the hardest bones in the body are the best preserved, which means the lower jaw, upper jaw, front of the skull. Um, those are the hardest bones in your body, so and the teeth, so that's what we have the most of. Ribs, uh, other bones in the body, vertebra, finger bones, very rare. Uh, this species never made it out of Africa. They evolved in Africa and went extinct in Africa. They did make tools. There is quite a bit of evidence that they made stone tools, uh, but they didn't use fire. They couldn't make fire. They didn't use fire. Got no evidence of burned bones or campfires. Um, and they were around for about a million years, so a fairly successful species. Uh, probably the beginning of hunting with this species, um, certainly they were probably scavenging carcasses because they were out in the grassland. And again, there's not much for a primate to eat out in the grassland unless you're eating other animals. The most famous skeleton from this species, all right, that's enough. Um, the most famous skeleton from this species is nicknamed Lucy. Um, and you can see here, it's actually not a very complete skeleton, but that just shows you how for most fossils that we find, they're really incomplete, you know, and many, many times it's just like one bone. <laughs> That's it. So this is a, what we call a fairly complete skeleton, and it has some really important bits, like having the hip bone and its articulation with the femur. That gives us a lot of information about walking. Having teeth, oh, that's really important. That's one of the ways that we really identify which species uh, a, a human ancestor belonged to. Um, and this is an artist's um, rendering. I forget which museum this is in, some museum in Europe. Uh, this is an artist's rendering of what they might have looked like based on a reconstruction of all of the skeletal remains that we have. We do know that, like chimpanzees, males and females were much different in size. Um, for chimpanzees, males are almost twice the weight of females. They're much more dimorphic in size than our species is. Our species, males and females are larger than females, but not by as much as for many other primates. Um, so that's what they thought uh, they would have looked like. And again, they were pretty short, so around four feet tall. Um, the first and oldest fossil remains of our own genus of Homo uh, was Homo habilis. And initially it was thought this was named habilis. Homo habilis means handyman. When uh, Homo habilis was discovered with stone tools, it was thought, aha, this is the beginning of tool making. But of course, now we know that chimpanzees make tools and probably the, all of our ancestors, all the way back to the split with chimpanzees, probably made tools. The Australopithecines made tools. So Homo habilis was not the first tool maker, but this is when we see brain size really start to take off, which is why this particular species is now in our genus because the brain size is now 
way outside of the range for all the rest of the primates. And that's what really makes our lineage unique is the very large brain size. So uh, this also indicates that our brain size was built on uh, increasing the amount of very nutrient-dense animal products in the diet, especially fatty parts of the animals. Um, our brains are mostly cholesterol and lipids, and that's very energy dense. So having that as part of the diet would have been very critical during our evolution. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that um, Homo habilis and all of the subsequent ancestors, uh, in fact, hunted, butchered, um, and made tools for different purposes, had different types of tools. Um, this species as well has not been found outside of Africa at all. Um, so lived and went extinct in Africa. Um, Homo erectus is one species as well that we have a lot of evidence for. This was the first human ancestor to leave Africa. Homo erectus left Africa. Remains of Homo erectus have been found in India, China, even on the island of Java uh, in the Pacific. The brain size now is about double the brain size of a chimpanzee. Um, we don't think that they had language yet, but they certainly probably had better communication. Chimpanzees communicate with each other. They probably did have communication, but probably not anything we would recognize as a language. Um, they were using fire. Homo erectus, we now have evidence of campfires uh, and regular use of campfires evidence they were cooking their food, namely uh, charred marrow bones. So they were taking the large uh, marrow containing bones from the animals that they killed and cooking the bones over the fire and eating the bone marrow probably, which is extremely uh, fat rich and full of lots of good things for growing brains. Um, but they were omnivorous. So there's evidence as well of them eating various kinds of plants, but they were certainly hunting. Now these guys were a little bit taller and gals, um, they were between five and six feet tall. So now we're in the range of modern human height. Uh, and they were also around for uh, about a million years. Um, the next species here, a little bit later, Homo heidelbergensis, named after um, the town where they were first discovered, although they originated in Africa as well. Homo heidelbergensis evolved in Africa. They have extensive remains of the species that have been found in Africa, and then they migrated out again. So um, Homo heidelbergensis made it to um, Asia and Europe, um, and they are considered the direct ancestor of our species and the direct ancestor of Neanderthals. Uh, Neanderthals are no longer considered our direct ancestor. They're considered another dead-end branch of the hominid, hominin uh, phylogeny. Um, so this species, they were as big as we are. They had brains the size of our brains. Um, they were, in fact, taller than the average human today. The average height was around six feet tall. Um, we start to see culture, evidence of culture with this species. Um, they, there's um, quite a few ritually buried dead that have um, fossilized flower pollen in the graves as if they had like put flowers in the graves with them. So uh, that certainly is very intriguing that this increase in brain size has now led to some kind of um, uh, interest in what ha what we should do with our dead, you know. Um, so they probably had some kind of language. If you're ritually burying your dead, you probably have some kind of communication. Uh, they probably could make fire. There's a difference between just using fire and making fire. So probably this species was making fire. They were um, uh, living in colder regions of Europe and Asia during one of the ice ages. So Certainly they had some kind of clothing probably as well. Uh, and they are, again, this is our next direct ancestor here. Um, Neanderthals, who are not any longer considered our direct ancestor, they are thought 
not to have evolved in Africa. No remains of Neanderthals have ever been found in Africa. Neanderthals are thought to have evolved in Europe or Asia. That's the only place where their remains are found. Um, and they coexisted in Europe and Asia with our species, which showed up out of Africa about 50,000 years ago. So Neanderthals were in Europe and Asia first. They evolved there from Homo heidelbergensis in those places. Our species evolved from the same ancestor, but in Africa. So they were Ice Age specialists. They were large herbivore hunting specialists. Um, they hunted mammoths and other large Ice Age animals. There's extensive evidence for that. They were um, uh, uh, bigger bone than we are. They had a denser skeleton. They weighed more at the same height. Uh, you know, if you saw one of them today, you probably would want to sign them up for the Chicago Bears. Um, and they went extinct about 35,000 years ago, possibly a little bit later. Those are the most recent remains that have been found. It's possible, you know, and very few individuals who die get fossilized. So it's quite possible that they actually survive much longer than that. And we just don't have any fossilized remains of those individuals. They do survive to this day, though, in Europeans and Asians' DNA. So if you're of European or Asian descent, and that includes all the way from Japan to India to uh, England, if your ancestors are from anywhere in there, you have Neanderthal DNA. And 1% to 4% of your DNA can actually be matched to the Neanderthals that we have. We have complete uh, DNA genomes from four individual Neanderthals now, and they're looking for more all the time. Uh, so that's very interesting, too, that anthropologists hypothesize that hybridization probably occurred, and now we have genetic evidence that, in fact, it, it did occur. Um, Denisovans are another interesting species that we don't know what they looked like. Um, it's possible that this other mysterious group, the red deer people, these birds are so noisy today. Stop it. That's enough. Uh, it's possible that the red deer people in China that um, uh, we have, so we have no DNA from the red deer people, just skulls and skeletal evidence. They were clearly not modern humans. They, were, uh, they weren't Neanderthals, so they were not modern humans, not Neanderthals. They could have been Denisovans, but we have no DNA. And then from this cave in Siberia, we have bones that DNA was extracted from, and it turns out that they are another species that's equally distantly related from Neanderthals to modern humans to Denisovans. They're equally distantly related. And they, the, the DNA, the bones that the DNA came out of are about 41,000 years old. And people who are Melanesian and Australian Aborigines, I have about 6% DNA from the Denisovans. So here we have yet again evidence of another hybridization event and we don't know how widespread the Denisovans are um, because we have so few remains of them. And they actually found one um, individual when they extracted DNA from them they turned out to be um, a second generation hybrid of a Denisovan and our species. So somebody who had one quarter Denisovan DNA, which meant one of their grandparents was one of these Denisovans. But we don't know what they look like unless they were the red deer people, um, which were found in uh, uh, China. So there was at least three species in our genus who were running around Europe and Asia 30,000 years ago. Neanderthals, the Denisovans, and us were running around. Uh, and the Denisovans and the Neanderthals went extinct. Now in Africa, there was yet another unknown species who hybridized with our species in Africa, and that species has not been identified yet either. So if you are of African ancestry, you have also about 5% of your DNA is from another species that hasn't been identified yet. So all humans alive today have evidence of hybridization with one of three archaic 
human species, either Neanderthals Denisovans or this as yet to be identified African species. Um, another interesting species that was discovered recently is a dwarf species uh, that was discovered on the island of Flores. And probably this species does not even belong in our genus of Homo. Um, uh, they're considered a dwarf Homo erectus. Um, and initially it was thought when the first few individuals were discovered that they were maybe um, some kind of genetic disorder or something was being represented. But in fact, it turns out they're just very, very small, uh, about three feet tall, which is why they were nicknamed the hobbits. Uh, the skeletons of eight different individuals were found in a cave. Um, they were about 50,000 years old. And they were hunters. There's butchered elephant bones in the cave as well, indicating that they were hunting and butchering the dwarf elephants that used to live on Flores Island and have, are extinct now. One of the interesting things about this species is they crossed very deep ocean. They had to use a boat. Uh, so, you know, so they were bo a boat building species as well uh, because they crossed the Wallace Line. The Wallace Line is a deep ocean trench um, in uh, the Pacific that separates islands. It separates Australia and Melanesia from the rest of the islands there um, off the coast of Asia. And uh, uh, it previously it was thought that only our species had managed to cross to uh, what's now, you know, Australia. But Homo erectus did apparently too. And then they evolved into this much smaller piece, species on this small island. So this is another interesting story which caused a lot of arguments and interesting debate, including the fact that when the scientists were there studying the remains and looking for more remains, they talked to the local people and they said, yeah, we found these uh, skeletal remains of these really short uh, people. And the, and the local villagers said, oh, we know who those are. Those are the Ibu Gogo. And my grandmother saw one once and they used to come into the village and beg for food and they couldn't talk and they have weird shaped heads and they didn't wear any clothes. Um, and so that left scientists wondering, could this species have gone extinct fairly recently? Like maybe in the last thousand years and that these stories have kind of remained with the local people. So intriguing possibility. Um, so our species, Homo sapiens, we have only been around for about 250,000 years. Uh, although something happened about 50,000 years ago. Our technology changed, our culture changed about 50,000 years ago. The um, anthropologists call it the Great Leap Forward. About 50,000 years ago, there was a huge explosion of artifacts, jewelry, cave art, uh, clothing, uh, complex stitching and things on clothing, musical instruments appear for the first time. Um, there's a lot of regional variation in these artifacts. Um, there's a lot of argument among anthropologists whether this represents some kind of last evolutionary step in our brain evolution. We don't know. But what we do know, and DNA has confirmed this now, now that we have DNA genomes from people all over the world, that our species was one small interbreeding population in Africa as recently as 50,000 years ago. And that's when the migration out to the rest of the world uh, really got going. There's a little bit of evidence for our species just outside of Africa in the Middle East that goes back about 90,000 years. Controversially, maybe as much as 110,000 years ago. But really, our species was in Africa. We were a small interbreeding population, and Mike started really migrating out to the rest of the world only about 50,000 years ago. So we, we are one single species. There's not that much difference between us. And one of the ways that we know that our species evolved in Africa is because that's where the greatest genetic diversity of our species is today. And that's... That's what we use for any species. So if you want to know where a species originated, you sample DNA and you look for where the DNA is the most diverse. So uh, people in Africa today have vast genetic diversity compared to anybody outside of Africa. Um, 
So that tells us that that's where our species has been the longest because it takes time to evolve genetic diversity. So our species has been in Africa the longest and that's where we originated. Um, if you're interested in human origins, uh, there are anthropology courses available. If you're interested in bones and evolution, that would be physical anthropology. If you're interested in cultural stuff, uh, that would be cultural anthropology. Sometimes courses combine the two for non-science majors, but that's available if you're interested in this topic. And that's the end for this chapter. Um, here's a nice little review slide for you to use. Uh, this is out of your book as well. Um, a little review of all of the core dates um, and what are the important characteristics of each group of core dates.